I'm going to speak today a little bit about participatory design for product innovation. Um, a little bit about me, I guess, is that uh, yeah, I finished my PhD uh, in 2015 in participatory design uh, and I worked with a community partner. So the relationship is a little bit similar to an industry link. Um, it was with a charitable organisation who do service provision for people with disabilities. So I'll speak a little bit about that, sort of the student perspective on doing this kind of research with an external body. Um, I was also a product design lecturer where I facilitated community-based learning projects as well, so that was the other side. And for the last uh, four years I've been working in industry in user experience, research and development for software, and then also qualitative research, service design, product design and workspace design. So um, today I want to give a little very high level overview of product design and the design process. I mean that's for software, for product design in tangible products which is where I kind of live. A lot of it is either medical device design or hardware design, interaction hardware rather than the software. Um, participatory design then as a way of doing product design. Uh, a little bit about my research, which was for assistive technology with the partnership with the community partner. And then a few tips or watch outs, particularly I suppose for, um, well actually academics or industry partners that might be engaging in participatory research as, as part of their, their project. So uh, product design, my kind of definition of it is that it's about identifying problems and developing solutions. It can sometimes be associated with making something look good or being a nice case for some technology, but it's about identifying real, real world user needs and coming up with elegant solutions that solve those, those needs. And there are many different design models, but a simple sort of good one is the UK Design Council model. There's four stages which is discover, and that's a, a, a user-centered research stage. Define, where you take those research findings, synthesize them, and frame problems to solve. Develop, where you're generating conceptual solutions. And delivery, where you're coming up and creating a product design specification, and then there's kind of loops of that until you get to a specification that you can manufacture and, and a product that you can use. Again, this is software or policy or, or product. It kind of is a design process that works across um, any number of, of, of disciplines when you're trying to come up with a new solution to something. And uh, there are different, uh, two different types of thinking. Divergent is where you're generating ideas and convergent where you're honing and developing and selecting those ideas. So. This is the general design model uh, to come up with solutions to problems. Participatory design then is about designing solutions to problems with the people that experience the problems. So lots of you might be familiar with user-centered design, which is it's just slightly different. It's designing for the people that need the solution. Participatory is designing with them. So really integrating them into the, into the design process. And my project, which I'll get onto, was with stakeholders, kind of um, internal stakeholders in the organization and also end users of the product. So depending on your industry, it might be that the university is going to engage with you as the stakeholder, as the industry partner, but also they may need to engage with your customers or your consumers, and that's going to allow a much more rounded um, solution to be, to be developed. Uh, yeah, it can, can be used, these methods, in, in many different disciplines, architecture, tangible product design, and software design. And I say this because I wanted to share with you my favorite example of participatory design, and it is an architecture one, but it kind of shows the power of participatory design. Um, it is set in Chile in 2010, uh, a massive earthquake destroyed over 80% of the buildings in a city called Constitucion, and a architecture firm called Elemental were brought in to plan the city rebuild, and they used participatory design to do it. 
uh, the money was very tight and initially the plan was to build uh, skyscrapers, cheap, fast buildings that they could put up and put a lot of people into. But through sessions with the residents and town meetings and um, engaging with the people who they were designing for, they realised that wasn't going to be an option that would work. There'd be uh, an uprising, basically. People needed to own their own, t own homes for cultural and social reasons. It was just the way they'd done things. So they came up with kind of a controversial and revolutionary um, solution, which was to give people half a house. They gave people a house with the tricky things to build, the, the plumbing, the bathroom, the kitchen, and it was on a site with roads and electricity and, and water. And then over time, they gave people instructions to build the rest of the house themselves. So they could have more ownership over the design, but also do it when they had the resources to buy the materials and, and, and as, as they could. So it solved the problem for the budget and it solved the problem for the people. So just a nice example of the power of it. Uh, that was another, another design in another city that was, that was used in Chile. And my favourite quote, which sums up participatory design, the power of it so well, was from the head architect uh, on that project. And he said, participatory design is not some hippie romantic, let's all drink together about the future kind of thing, nor is it about trying to find the right answer with participants. Rather, it's about trying to identify with precision what is the right question, because answering the wrong question well is still wrong. And that's the whole idea of participatory design and work that links industry and, and, and universities as well. It's so that we can develop solutions that are meeting a real need. Uh, the other thing that's nice about this is, you know, participation can be seen as kind of a tokenistic political endeavor to be seen to be involving people, but it's actually a way to really develop better solutions um, and also it's a little bit of a misnomer because participatory design sounds like you're actually trying to get to the solution with participants you're not you're involving them in the process so that you can come up with the solution as the designer but they're in the problem framing stage so yeah <coughs> a little bit about my project then um, which was in assistive technology what is assistive technology? It's any product or service that helps somebody with a disability kind of break down the barriers in their environment or experience the barriers to a lesser extent. It can be low or high tech, a pair of glasses is assistive technology, an electric wheelchair is assistive technology. Um, and there are big issues with it at the moment. It's very expensive, partly because it can't enjoy good economy of scale. Somebody with a disability has a very unique set of needs. So a product is only going to be suitable for a very small number of people. So if you're making less, less, of, a, less of a product, you're distributing less of a product, it's going to be more expensive. And then the other problem is that it's very often abandoned. They can look very clinical, which means that people feel stigmatized and don't want to use it anymore. And um, they're also can be hard to use or hard to maintain. So my research aimed to address these issues through design, through participatory design. Um, and I was going to design a framework for developing adaptable assistive technology through the practical design of a device. So the devices that I was looking at were computer input devices. So this is any product. When somebody can't use a mouse or a keyboard, they use switches and joysticks. And yet people use voice control and eye gaze technology. But just as people without disabilities still go to the mouse and keyboard, a lot of people with disabilities still go to these kind of tools. Um, and one of the ways that I was going to do this, and this is kind of suitable for um, software design as well, was using mass customization. And the way I like to explain it is with a whisk. Um, the idea is that it's modular design and you include all the complexity and cost into one module, which is like the handle with the motor and the cable. And then you have other modules that you can attach onto this central module to give a lot more functionality. So there's lots of examples of it in software. I mean, Squarespace, the website where you can go and kind of choose parts of it to build your own website is an example of it in software. Um, and that's an example of it there in, in hardware. Cars are another place where it happens a lot. So that was one, one element of it. And the second element of it was the participatory design. So 
That was, you know, thanks to the generosity of the community partners, the Central Remedial Clinic, Enable Ireland and the Cedar Foundation in the north, which is different from the Cedar Foundation that you were talking about earlier on. Um, so the key for the team that's working on the project, because it is, it is a team, there's always going to be a collaboration between the student, the, 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 the staff member in the university and the, the industry or community partner that's taking part as well. So once you know who should participate, the idea next is to find and develop methods that not only suit the needs of the project, but suit the needs of the stakeholder because some people are going to be more time poor, some people are going to have different needs when they're, when they're um, doing um, or inv being involved in the research. So some good starter resources, uh, very nice kind of uh, interfaces on these four as well, just to have a, have a first look around. It's not an exact science participatory design. It's, um, it's qualitative, it's uh, messy, it's uh, conversations co-creation groups, interviews, prototyping, ethnography, games, journey mapping. There's any amount of ways to um, try and identify user needs. And I know in SAP, they probably do a lot of this as well. About make tools, uh, Frog, the design consultancy, IDEO has the design kit methods there. And usability book of knowledge is a good software starter as well. So for, for methods to, to get, get you started. Um, and to remember that the aim is not to design the solution, but to frame the problem. And to look at that with the team and when you're speaking with participants, what you're looking for is frustrations that people have with the current systems or services that they use and workarounds that they use to get around those frustrations. And then to kind of look at those, analyze them, and to get to a set of needs, whether they're known by the end user or latent by the end user, not known or not acknowledged. Um, and that's kind of your starter point then to develop a solution. So um, I won't go into this. I used uh, two methods, a Delphi study for the service providers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists. They had different needs. Um, and the journal the article is there if you'd like more info. Um, and the other one was design workshops with people with cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and uh, acquired brain injury. So you can see it's very tactile, very visual, and um, questions were provided to participants beforehand in case they wanted to pre-record their answers on voice output devices. So quite a complex um, group to, to work with, but uh, some of these tools could be used uh, to, you know, with, with uh, people without disabilities as well. Um, and uh, some examples of frustrations, uh, assistive technology companies don't modify their products and sometimes obstruct users from making modifications and people's needs change over time. And some workarounds then just to kind of give an idea of what a workaround is and what a frustration is. People end up retrofitting their devices with new parts. This lady used a cork, she felt it was more comfortable um, and changing the mechanical constitution of devices to adapt sensitivity. So some people have high muscle tone, low muscle tone, more or less available force to activate a device, which is kind of um, a big thing for people. So the next step is to iteratively develop solutions and get feedback. Again, it's a collaborative thing between the university, the student and the, the um, industry partner. So this was some of my prototyping stages and uh, in the end coming up with a, a device based on a touchpad but which could be um, rearranged to act as a joystick, a mini keyboard um, and switches in various different layouts. Um, and it was also dishwasher kind of safe, which was a big thing for maintenance and um, disassemblable, quite easy and a mechanism to change the, uh, the required force to activate the device. That was the design framework, and I won't go into it too much, but um, what I will say is that it's important to come up with a way to actually use the information that you're finding out during your participatory design. It's not a tokenistic thing. There needs to be a framework or some way that you're going to make sure you use the information. So the last thing that I wanted to do was just leave you with a few um, kind of tips or things that I learned during doing the project that should hopefully be generically helpful if you're doing a, a project that involves um, various stakeholders. Um, this is very much the university or the student perspective 
ethical applications are these long, unending forms that uh, can be quite daunting, but they can actually be very helpful. Um, industry and community partners and universities have different concerns, uh, but uh, just they're actually planning tools. That's their purpose. So they can help you formulate research objectives or design objectives and make sure that you're um, Acknowledging beneficence and relevance to the participants, data protection, informed consent, dissemination, sampling, ISO standards, and that was actually not non-disclosure agreement, so that, that's probably another thing, and that was the National Disability Authority had specific recommendations for my project, but there may be specific recommendations depending on your participant group. Um, recruitment, attrition and flexibility. Recruiting more people than you think that you need and being flexible when things don't go as expected. Involving people in, in, in research or in a design process, it won't go as expected. So just being flexible um, is important. Uh, it does take a little bit longer than if you're not involving um, participants, but it's well worth it because you will be meeting real needs and you'll be able to provide evidence then to um, the purse string holders that what you're doing is, is meeting a real need. Um, but it does mean you know planning the process in as much detail as possible. Embrace criticism. There will be uh, criticism and uh, expectations that uh, you'll meet, but a negative response to an idea can contribute to a better solution as well. Um, rigorous analysis. There's two references for ways to make sure you're using your findings in your solution, just a way of framing and, and, and using your, your research findings. <laughs> This is a tricky one, it's kind of a systemic issue. Academic research outputs are papers or learning outcomes and real world outputs are a product at the end of the day. And um, so again, that's really about just having a conversation and keeping, have, keep on having conversations about is everybody getting what they want to get out of, out of this. Um, and finally, closing the loop is important for a community partner, it's important for industry that the information is shared and disseminated properly at the end and hopefully um, even reflected upon and used within the industry, within the university as well, just the, the way the project went, just to keep on building a better best practice kind of book of knowledge on how to do these projects. So thanks.